have thought just a few years ago that for $2,000, you'd be able to get a small and light uh, photo and video camera uh, with a full frame image sensor that can be used for both serious filmmaking, but also vlogging. Well, here we are, and it's all possible on the new Panasonic S5. First, let me start off kind of talking about all the, the good things about this camera. So, like I mentioned before, it's small, but it does have that same full frame sensor that the Panasonic S1H has. And it's a beautiful sensor uh, that can capture 14 plus steps of uh, dynamic range. Uh, and it just really looks good, it looks very cinematic, creates beautiful colors. Uh, this camera can record in 4K up to 60 frames per second and it can also do slow motion up to 180 frames per second in uh, standard HD. It's also a great low light camera and again it's thanks to the, the same image sensor that it shares with the Panasonic uh, S1H and it has again the same dual native ISOs. The only difference between, I would say, between this camera and the Panasonic S1H is that uh, in this camera you can't manually choose the ISO range. The camera will actually automatically switch uh, for you and pick either the high or the low ISO range. But in all of my testing so far, this hasn't been a problem. It always picks uh, the, the right range. And uh, at the end of the day, like I'm saying, low light images look beautiful and look clean. Uh, this camera also has an amazing image stabilization system built into it. It has the in-body image stabilization when combined with, let's see, stabilized lenses or even without them. It produces nice and smooth shots. Many times they actually look almost like they're gimbal shots, even though uh, I was walking around just hand holding the camera like this. And this is uh, actually, again, very similar, although not the same as the Panasonic S1H. That's because the uh, S1H has a six step uh, body in-body image stabilization. Whereas this camera uh, has a five step in body image stabilization, but uh, to be honest, in all of my testing, you can't really see it much of a difference. Like I said, at the end of the day, especially when you combine it with like a stabilized lens, and then if you do, let's say, electronic uh, image stabilization, the, the image looks beautiful, nice and smooth. I would almost say that, uh, let's say if you don't have a gimbal or can't afford it or don't have the time maybe to put the camera on a gimbal, uh, you can actually fake what, what I think look almost like gimbal shots just by being careful how you walk with the camera. When it comes to the codex, this camera can shoot uh, in H.264 and H.265, uh, both in 10-bit and 8-bit uh, codex. There's a lot of different options there and they're very efficient codex. Uh, so you can get a lot of footage, really good quality footage on, uh, on a standard uh, card. 
but in the future firmware update this camera is even gonna have 5.9k raw output through the hdmi port and that's again you know something that in a two thousand dollar mirrorless camera is uh, is very hard to find and i think it's something that is gonna open up this camera to to be able to be used for really serious filmmaking where you want the, the ultimate in, uh, image quality and if you are going to be doing a lot of serious filmmaking, then another really good thing uh, that about this camera is that it actually comes included with the Panasonic VLAC uh, image profile. It's not a separate purchase like it is on some of their other cameras. So again, right out of the box, you can start recording in VLAC. And if you've seen some of my reviews of the other Panasonic cameras and where I talk about VLAC, then you'll know that it's a great image profile that allows you again to capture the most dynamic range, but it's also easy in post-production to work with, color grade and all that stuff. Another really cool thing is that in a $2,000 uh, hybrid camera, mirrorless camera, you can shoot anamorphic video and, and actually does a really good job with it. Gives you a lot of options, gives you a lot of options even in, uh, in camera so you can properly de-squeeze the image as uh, various settings for various uh, squeeze aspect ratios of, of different anamorphic lenses. Now, what about uh, overheating? I know some of you guys are probably going to be wondering, uh, simply because of some of the, the other cameras from other manufacturers these days that have had overheating problems. I can tell you, it doesn't matter how far I push this camera, and I did push it, uh, there's really nothing you know that you have to worry about when it comes to overheating. Never once did the camera slow down on me or give me any kind of worrying. So, no overheating issues, uh, at least in my testing. Now, when it comes to battery life, uh, out of this single battery, you're gonna get around two hours. Again, depends on how you're shooting and all that stuff, but nonstop two hours. Uh, now, another thing to just be aware of is that even though this battery looks very similar to the batteries that, let's say, the Panasonic GH5 uses, it's actually a different battery. So you will need to get these new batteries. And uh, yeah, just, just keep that in mind. So if you're, for example, own already some of the previous Panasonic cameras like the GH5, uh, you will have to stack up now and, and buy a new set of these batteries. Now let's talk about the not so great things about this camera, which there aren't many, but the biggest one I would say, at least for me, uh, is just, like I said, the camera is greatly designed, like, you know, the way that the buttons are laid out and it's it's really designed very well for both of you want to take photos, which by the way, it does take beautiful stills, uh, but, if, but for video recording, it has all the right functions, it has a nice uh, flip out screen, all that stuff. So ergonomically, it's I think it's a really great camera. Now, the only thing that I really wish Panasonic would have done is to include a full-size HDMI port. Uh, unfortunately, all you get is a micro, not even a mini, but a micro HDMI port. 
And for me, again, especially if, I, if I'm going to be, let's say, considering about using, you know, a camera, you know, like like this one, with an external recorder that can record raw for like a really pro project, um, you know, I, I really don't want to be relying on a micro HDMI connection. I had problems with that on on the Panasonic GH4, and actually, kind of basically, my camera died on me. Or, or I should say the Panasonic GH4 still works, but the HDMI on it stopped working. And because I, I would, you know, would prefer to record to an external recorder, it just kind of meant that I no longer uh, I'm going to be using that camera for um, for any pro professional kind of work. So the same kind of worry now uh, I see is, is with this camera in the future is that that micro HDMI port is just way too flimsy, breaks down too easily, and if it does break replacing this i don't even know if it's possible or how much it will cost but again it's a, it's it's a huge thing i think for me at least it's it's a deal breaker so although this can be used for personal filmmaking uh and definitely if you're not going to be using an external recorder it probably won't be an issue but if you are like me and you do like to record the highest quality to an external recorder then that's something to consider now i'm sure you'll be able to get some cages or something that holds the cable nice and steady for you so although i know that some of you guys probably won't care about that uh to me i really really wish that they just had simply gone with a full-size hdmi port Now another thing that's not so great about this camera is the uh, autofocus system. Now it does have an improved autofocus system, especially when you compare it to the other or previous Panasonic cameras. It does have both face and eye detection, and uh, and it does a decent job. But it's again nowhere near as fast or, or, or as reliable as let's say some Sony or Canon cameras. So that's something where I feel like Panasonic has always struggled. For me, that's not a big deal, not a you know deal breaker because I'm not one who really ever relies on autofocus. Uh, so again, if you're doing kind of more cinema style work where you're going to be manually focusing it, you probably won't care. But if you, for example, do rely on autofocus for let's say wedding videos or uh, maybe you're vlogging, which again, this camera is great for vlogging because uh, you know it has that flip out screen uh, it actually, if you get this kit lens here, uh, which is the, the 20 to 60 millimeter lens, it's, it's a great vlogging lens. Uh, and, and it's a small light camera, like I said, so it's a great vlogging camera. And when it comes to vlogging, actually, I would say the AF is sufficient because 
when you're close to the camera and you're facing the camera, then, then it can focus on you, no problem. The issues with the autofocus are really when the subject, let's say, disappears somewhere or t you know turns away from the camera or things like that. Uh, and the, the, the tracking system loses the subject. And then when it requires the subject again, it can get the autofocus, but it's just not as fast, not as snappy as, as it is uh, with some of the other uh, cameras out there. Now, some of the other maybe negative things to be aware of are some of the limitations with this camera uh, when it comes to different recording modes. So, uh, although it is a full frame camera, once you're recording in 4K above 30 frames per second, uh, the camera is gonna crop into an APS-C size image sensor or the same thing if you're gonna be switching to any of the anamorphic modes. There's also a time record limit on this camera. Uh, so if you're recording in uh, 4K 60p, the limit is gonna be 30 minutes. Also, if you're recording in 10-bit, both in 4K or anamorphic, you're gonna get a 30-minute uh, recording limit. Uh, if you're recording in 8-bit or recording in 1080p or full HD, then uh, there is no time limit. Now, if you're looking at getting different lenses for the Panasonic uh, S5, then uh, the lenses I would consider uh, or suggest that you get is definitely buy the camera with the kit lens, uh, the 20 to 60 millimeter uh, new kit lens uh, from Panasonic because uh, it's an overall great lens. It's small, light, considering again it's a full frame lens uh, and it's great for vlogging as well as some casual kind of you know photo or, or video capturing. Now if you want to step up your game uh, then definitely consider getting uh, these two lenses I got. Uh, this one is the Sigma 24 to 70. It's a pretty budget-friendly option uh, when it comes to full-frame lenses that are fast uh, and in that similar focal range. Uh, if you want to get something even longer, uh, then this Lumix 70 to 200 is another great option. Uh, and uh, and again, with these two lenses alone, you're gonna cover the whole focal range that you're really ever gonna need to use. Now, like I said, if you're buying the camera, you might as well get the kit lens because this is an overall just a nice kind of a compact and light full frame lens that, that's gonna be good for, like I said, for vlogging, you know, behind the scenes or kind of just maybe your home video kind of stuff. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a lens that you don't mind beating around or even if you drop it or something, uh, if it gets dinged up a little bit, you're probably not gonna cry versus, you know, if you damage <laughs> these more expensive lenses. So in conclusion, what do I think of the Panasonic S5? Uh, well, I would say it's very similar, and I mean very, very similar to the Panasonic S1H, uh, although it's smaller, lighter, uh, and it has some, like I said, recording limitations, but uh, if it can also produce the same beautiful image. Uh, can be used, again, like I said, for vlogging because it is smaller and lighter and has a flip out screen, but it can also be used for some serious filmmaking. So if, let's say you were looking at and kind of considering getting the Panasonic S1H, uh, but maybe you just can't afford uh, that price tag, uh, then for $2,000 you can get yourself, I would say, an almost identical uh, S1H with slight, slight limitations, like I mentioned. Now, if you're looking at, sort of at all the other kind of camera manufacturers and what they have, and when it comes to 4K uh, hybrid or mirrorless cameras uh, that are good for video recording, there's a lot of options these days, and every camera is going to have an advantage and disadvantage in different areas. So you really just kind of have to look up at all those different, I would say, issues and, and sort of the, the good things about each camera and see which one fits the most. If you're really somebody, I mean, at the end of the day, I would say uh, if you don't care about the autofocus uh, or the, the you know micro HDMI port, uh, then this is a really great and a very affordable 4K mirrorless camera that's, again, full frame. Uh, now, if those two things are a deal breaker, then you're probably going to end up looking somewhere else. But like I said, for me, those things aren't uh, much of an issue, aside from the H HDMI port. But then again, uh, I'm probably going to be using this more uh, sort of as my backup camera, kind of a B camera. So in that case, it's uh, I think it's going to, you know, it's, it's a good choice to go with. Anyways, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure, as always, you guys follow me on my website at tomantosfilms.com. Uh, subscribe to my newsletter while you're there. You get some free gifts in return and you'll be able to stay up to date with uh, new camera gear reviews, filmmaking news, or uh, tutorials. Uh, and once again, my name is Tom Antos, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.